high occupancy vehicle or HOV lanes. We're gonna get into all the different varieties, how they work, if they work, and whether we should be building them at all. And it's coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics are often very good and they come to me all kinds of ways, sometimes in my DMs. Name redacted to protect the innocent, but I did like this one. Hey there, love your videos. My boyfriend is from Toronto and I'm from Pittsburgh. We've been wondering about HOV lanes. What's the idea? Do they work? Most egregious ones? And some stuff about Pittsburgh, which has gotten far too much coverage on this channel. Just curious and think it would be a good video. Sending this message while my boyfriend battles the infamous 401 traffic. Oh man, I do want to do a video specifically on Highway 401 in Toronto, purportedly the busiest freeway in the world, but another time. Anyway, I really like this HOV topic because it's kind of a way into talking about things that are interesting to me and that I also think are really important, like traffic dynamics, regional planning, and kind of the politics of how we decide what infrastructure to invest in. Let's kick this off with the basics. What is an HOV lane? I'll start with a very simple example, which is what I believe is still, after all this time, the only HOV lane in the state of Oregon. It's on I-5 northbound, and it's the leftmost of I-5's three lanes as it runs the final three and a half miles or so before it reaches the interstate bridge. It's just an HOV 2+, plus, which means you need a minimum of two people in the car to be able to use it and it's only effective from 3 to 6 p.m. There is no corresponding southbound HOV lane. I'm gonna come back and talk more about why Portland only has this one HOV lane, but let's look at what it actually does. First, I need to give you some background on regional travel dynamics. Oregon has a state income tax and no sales tax, and Washington has a state sales tax, but no income tax. This arrangement incentivizes some pretty weird stuff. A lot of sprawl in Clark County on the Washington side, and a lot of driving from Clark County into Portland, but not that much driving the opposite way that originates from Oregon. And one more thing to help you make sense of this, there's basically no transit to speak of running between Vancouver, Washington and Portland, Oregon. Clark County's transit agency, C-TRAN, does run a commuter bus on I-5, but it only runs every 15 to 20 minutes at peak times. There is a long history of Oregon side agencies like Metro and TriMet trying to extend light rail into Clark County, but there's been active hostility to that idea on the Washington side. Okay, that's the setup. Now, remember there are three lanes here and there is one other bridge, I-205, which has four lanes, but that's it and it's just not nearly enough capacity if everyone who wants to live in Clark County and go into Oregon constantly for tax-free shopping just drives there in their own car. In fact, here's how traffic develops on a typical Wednesday afternoon, according to Google. The congestion starts at the bridge in the early afternoon and just starts spilling back into the whole transportation network on the Oregon side. Remember, most of this traffic is Washington license plates, so really what we're looking at is suburban drivers from the north side of the river who often don't pay taxes in Oregon, imposing huge costs in terms of delay and emissions and safety on Portlanders who are just minding their own business. And keep in mind, North Portland is historically more racially diverse and less affluent. It's pretty appalling if you think about it. Note that once you get to the bridge, it pretty much opens up to free flow. So this is a textbook bottleneck. It's a bit more complicated than this, but essentially there's a single point where you get the biggest mismatch between demand and capacity. And that's where this Hayden Island on-ramp merges with the I-5 main line just before you get on the bridge. It's a classic pinch point with complete bumper to bumper congestion upstream and basically free flow conditions downstream. 
Let's come back to the HOV lane. It ends right at the point of the bottleneck where general traffic is allowed to merge back into the left lane. So it doesn't provide free flow conditions all the way to the Washington side. Instead, what it does is people in the HOV lane move pretty quickly until they get to the back of wherever the queue in that lane ends which depends on how deep into rush hour you are. But the queue in the HOV lane tends to be significantly shorter than the queue in the two general purpose lanes. Important to note that for people who are stuck in bumper to bumper congestion, HOV lanes often appear to be empty or at least underutilized in the most maddening possible way. But in reality, you're all just in a single queue where more efficient vehicles are being prioritized ahead of you. Okay, let's backtrack and talk about why we build HOV lanes. It's really to reduce vehicle miles traveled or VMT by combining trips in a single vehicle with the objective of reducing congestion and emissions. So really, an HOV lane is a way of incentivizing maybe a bit of transit use, but mostly carpooling. So let's look at what might be the site of the most infamous HOV lane and carpooling dynamic in the US the Oakland approach to the Bay Bridge between the East Bay and San Francisco. There are no HOV lanes on the bridge itself, only on the approach to the toll plaza. So again, it's essentially a queue bypass. Carpools have to be three or more people as evidenced by the <laughs> thermoplastic three in the diamond. And each carpool vehicle pays only a $3.50 toll, while the toll for all other passenger cars is seven bucks. There's a bit more nuance around time of day and different vehicle types, but that's the gist. So if you're a daily commuter into San Francisco who isn't taking transit for whatever reason, splitting a 350 toll three or four ways compared to paying $7 a day is not insignificant over the course of a year. Also, the queue in the HOV lanes at the toll plaza tend to be much shorter than those in the general purpose lanes, so you save a lot of time too. The benefits are so great that there's a whole ecosystem around this particular HOV lane that's known as casual carpooling. Complete strangers line up at designated locations and drivers roll through, picking up enough passengers to qualify for the HOV. And maybe they ask for a dollar donation from each passenger. It's very weird stuff if you don't live in the Bay Area, but it's the Bay Area. Extreme transportation and land use conditions call for extreme measures. Okay, I talked about how a lot of HOV lanes function as essentially a queue bypass, and this is nowhere more true than it is at ramp meter signals, like this on-ramp at 45th on I-5 southbound in Seattle. But sometimes HOV lanes are just an entire facility. These are the I-5 express lanes, they run in peak direction only, so southbound in the AM, and then WatchDot closes and clears the lanes around midday, and then runs them northbound in the PM peak. They aren't strictly HOV lanes, but there are a lot of access points you just can't use unless you're a two plus vehicle. Let's talk about one more flavor of HOV lanes, and that's the high occupancy toll or hot lane. An example is SR-167 south of Seattle. So from a traffic throughput perspective, you want a freeway lane running at around 1,800 vehicles an hour. Anything much higher than that, and you get into congestion, which means stop and go traffic, which actually reduces the effective capacity of a travel lane, which is not good. And anything lower than 1,800 means you're underutilizing the travel lane, you're leaving capacity on the table. So it's hard to manage that with just a static occupancy restriction. A hot lane solves this dilemma by taking an HOV lane, actively monitoring the demand in real time, and then selling off any excess capacity by charging single occupant vehicles a dynamic market-based toll rate that's set to backfill the traffic volume so you get closer to that optimal 1800 or so. Honestly, I should just make a standalone video about hot lanes because there are so many interesting questions they raise. How do you enforce them? How does dynamic pricing work? Are they regressive? This video is kind of going too long as it is though. Okay, if I've made HOV lanes sound like a good idea, 
probably gonna squash that in a minute. But first, usual reminder to drop a like on the video and subscribe if you're into weekly videos on random transportation land use related topics, even about freeways occasionally, but from the perspective of someone who actually likes cities. All the usual ways to connect on a variety of websites. If you're interested in supporting the channel directly, which is appreciated, Patreon is the preferred method. So here's the thing. Everything I've shown you here costs money, and more than that, it costs political capital. An HOV lane isn't just some extra thermoplastic and a couple signs. It's a whole new layer of surveillance and enforcement mechanisms, and a lot of times it is infrastructure. And it's definitely a political lift to get the public to buy off on having dedicated space for preferred users on publicly funded roadways. This is as good a time as any to zoom out and talk a bit about regional planning in the US, which is embodied in Metropolitan Planning Organizations, or MPOs, which exist in every urbanized area over 50,000 population. MPOs establish transportation funding priorities that support things like the regional economy, social equity, and importantly, air quality. They manage and allocate funds from federal programs, and the example I want to use here is the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Program, or CMAQ. CMAQ was established in 1991 and gets re-upped regularly, including in 2021, as part of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. CMAQ is what it says it is. The funds are only available for projects that are defensible investments in mitigating congestion and improving air quality. And you can really tell a lot about a region by how they spend those kinds of funds. Houston, Texas has built hundreds of miles of HOV lanes, including as part of one of the most mind-blowing recent infrastructure investments, the Katy Freeway. Other MPOs, like Portland's Metro, have had kind of an unwritten LRT, not HOV policy for years. They spend CMAQ money mostly on transit and active transportation projects. Because here's the thing, HOV lanes are really just another example of the Anthony Downs concept of triple convergence, which explains how new roadway capacity induces more travel. Well-managed HOV lanes increase the person throughput of a roadway, and that encourages people who might have otherwise taken a different route or driven at a different time or taken transit to use a car at peak times instead. Those casual carpools in the Bay Area I talked about, in a lot of cases, that's faster and cheaper than BART. It just seems like a policy failure. Are HOV lanes more efficient than general purpose lanes? Sure, marginally so, if they're well managed. But also, they're a bit of a relic from a time where we thought of all transportation problems as commuting problems, where everyone is coming from the suburbs into the central city in the morning, every day, and then leaving in the evening. But transportation isn't that simple. Great cities have downtowns that are active day and night, and they're polycentric. The transportation demands are everywhere, and you really need to invest in a whole network, not just peak commute times and directions. So yes, HOV lanes are better than nothing, but I would just suggest that the transportation investments we spend our political capital on should probably meet a higher standard than better than nothing. Besides, and maybe this is the biggest thing, as a recovering English major, the terminology just rankles me. As I imagine a famous Australian action movie hero might say, that's not a high occupancy vehicle lane, that's a high occupancy vehicle lane. I can't do the Australian accent. Okay, roll the patron credits cause that is all I got. Thanks for joining and special thanks to those of you who are supporting the channel directly for keeping me fueled up on patatas bravas and weird but delicious seafood delicacies while I'm holed up in Spain. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week. Probably another installment on Spanish urbanism. To be determined, but I'll see you then.